Choir director rocks on that organ, I just gotta say. So will you please open your bulletin, please? Join me in the call to worship. By awesome deeds, you answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation. By your strength, you established the mountains. You silenced the roaring sea, the roaring of their ways, the tumult of the peoples. Shall we pray? Good and gracious God, you promise to pour out your spirit upon us. You are the hope of the world. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. You rescue us from evil and clothe us with love. Give us strength that we might serve you. Make us humble that we might live for your glory alone. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us together to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Open your hymnal to 247, please.
a reading from Joel. Joel 2, verses 23 through 32. O children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain. The early and the latter rain is before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, and my great army, which I set against you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously for you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and there is no other. And my people shall never again be put to shame. Then afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and the young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves in those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will show portents in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall, there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Praises to God's name. I will 
morning. We'll check out this mic. How's it, how's it working? Okay, great. Um, the passage for today from Joel is not a, this is a, this is a book of the Bible that we don't usually hear about or read, so I was kind of drawn to it. Um, and particularly the verses, uh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, because this is a very, this is one that I, we hear often. But then I started looking at the locusts in this passage, so I'm going to talk about that instead. Because, you know, this past summer, do, how many of you caught the cicada invasion, the 17-year um, cycle? Now, I know some had, had quite a few in their backyards and all. I could only hear them as I was driving along because where I live, we didn't, we didn't get them. But how many of you in here saw, actually saw the hordes of, oh, a number of you have, yeah. So it's the billion plus cicadas that hatch every 17 years, right? And uh, it's spectacular, it's kind of scary, it's kind of creepy looking, uh, knowing but not any apocalyptic destruction that we know of, right? In fact, when I went on cleveland.com, there were recipes posted to take advantage of the glut of this once in 17 year Epicurean delicacy that is high protein, low fat, low carb, and gluten free. Now I know we're concerned about gluten free in this congregation, so I just want you to know that cicadas are gluten free. And so they had these great recipes posted. Cicadalicious pizza, yum. And this one I particularly like for obvious reasons. Crispy wok tossed cicada. Yum, 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 with a little bit of sesame oil. And there's emergence cookies, which are like chocolate cookies. You form them in a ball, and then you know how, those of you who bake, you know how we press the cookie a little bit and then put it on the, the cookie sheet, and then you put a cicada on top and then bake it. Isn't that just delicious? Great way. Yes, you didn't expect to come to a Sunday service and get a cooking lesson, did you, or at least? <laughs> Maybe I should have brought in a demonstration, but no. Anyway, there have been uh, references to the cicadas being kind of like a plague of locusts emerging from their sleeping place and then descending on us like, like the locusts. But I'm here to tell you it's not, it's not quite the same. And in this book of Joel from the, um, <clears throat> from the Old Testament, it's only three chapters long, but he spends half of it talking about locusts. Uh, so I don't know, if, if you've never read this, it's really, it's really interesting um, and kind of horrifying. So he talks about a locust invasion and the mass destruction that comes with it. So just to give you an idea, um, <clears throat> here, well, here in verse 25, we read, the swarming locust has eaten the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter. Well, what is all that anyway? It's the locusts. When the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has, what the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. Here in, it's here in, in chapter 1 in Joel. So he says, Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, you wine drinkers, over the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. And he goes on about all the horrors of what the locusts have done. Put on your sackcloth and lament, you priests. Wail, you ministers of the altar. Come and pass the night in sackcloth. So he says, alas for the day, the seed shrivels under the clods, the storehouses are desolate, the granaries are ruined because the grain has failed. How the animals groan, the herds of cattle wander about because there's no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep are dazed. Be dismayed, you farmers, wail, you vine dressers, for the crops of the field are ruined, the vine withers the fig tree droops, and he goes on and on and describes this horrifying scene. 
So we often hear about the locusts, the plague of locusts, you know, in Egypt and all, but do we really understand just how horrible it is? So I wanted to tell you um, about the, the last time we had a plague of locusts in the United States. Do you all know about it? In the Midwest, 1875. This is just to give you a sense. So I feel like I'm in the middle of a horror movie or something, just trying to paint this picture for you. But I want, it, but I want us to kind of get a feel, just feel how awful it is, what these folks in Israel were experiencing. So this fellow back in 1875 in Colorado Springs, because the, the locusts came across, it was Colorado, Wyoming, Nebraska, um, Kansas. And I, I remember from my years living in Nebraska, we still talked about the locusts. Um, so they still remembered it. Um, the ground literally covered two and three inches deep and it glittered like a new dollar because they're all, you know, moving. And so two and three inches, yeah, ugh, ah. And then they circle and myriads around you, beating on everything, driving into doors, open windows, and then they, they keep up around your feet they bite at everything they come into contact with just to test and see if they can eat it. Blah. And the noise that they make, that all their jaws going rah, 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 well, they engage in their work of destruction and it sounds like the roar of a prairie fire. So you hear this roaring noise coming through, then you see these waves of locusts, it's like waves of an ocean. And then they come and then they start chewing on everything they come into contact with. They even would eat the clothes off of people if you happen to be out there and caught in that. So people back east, meaning places like Ohio, would smile incredulously at our statements that the locusts impeded the trains on the railroad tracks. Yet it was not infrequent, the insects pawing over the tracks or basking thereon so numerously that the oil from their crushed bodies reduce the tractions to actually stop the trains. So these were the years of great devastation in Nebraska, Kansas, and all those states. They came in thick flying clouds. Now the cloud of locusts was 1,800 miles long and 110 miles wide. 1874, 1875. They destroyed what they could find then that was green and juicy enough for them. Well, thank goodness that Rocky Mountain, it was called the Rocky Mountain Locust. They're extinct now. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Um, they were drove into extinction basically by our more modern agricultural methods. So you can imagine the horror of a plague of locusts that Joel was talking about and what these folks were facing, and what people still in Africa today and in the Middle East sometimes face when the weather conditions are just right for the hatching of these insects. And Northern Africa was devastated by a plague of locusts as recently as 1988. So they eat everything in sight, they cause famine, and then you've got billions of dead carcasses piled up that breed disease, so typhus sets in, and you have this really horrifying picture. It really literally is a matter of life and death. So when we read about these plagues of locusts in the Bible, it's really, really, really bad. And so in 225, Joel says, I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent against you. The people of Israel had been enduring the locusts for years at this point. And here they'd also endured the destruction of Jerusalem, exile, locusts, what more, right? Joel sees the plague as a sign of God's judgment against the people of Israel because he sees the fate of the land and the fate of the people as kind of intertwined. Um, and God is God over all, right? So Joel is making the point that we must call upon the name of God. We need to be in relationship with God, uphold our end of the relationship, and then we will find, we will find plenty and be satisfied. If not, 
then we'll, we will encounter suffering. So the swarm of locusts, um, the way I look at it is the swarm of locusts, the death and destruction that they bring to the people is symbolic of our broken relationship with God. Where God's people, namely us, have somehow fallen short. But that's not where God wants to leave the relationship. And last week we heard from Jeremiah that God will be our God, we will be God's people, and God will write it upon our hearts. And Joel echoes this sentiment. The people of Israel throughout their history have had their ups and downs. They've been faithful, unfaithful. They've experienced all kinds of horrific things, and they've experienced some good things. But through all that, God is with them. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I, the Lord, am your God and there is no other. So God is our only real help in times of trouble. And that's what Israel experienced. We may not see the natural disasters as God's judgment on us. We don't generally think that way any longer. I mean, some people do. When, when the hurricane hits, we think, oh, that's God punishing the people, but I don't, I don't really think that way, and I think a, a number of us don't really think that way. But we still do suffer the, the devastation of these natural disasters. We may not suffer the plague of locusts, but we have our own disasters to contend with. We have our own personal disasters that we contend with. And so these uh, two family therapists, Betty Carter and Monica McGoldrick, they identify two different kinds of stressors that cause suffering for people. And I thought this was kind of interesting. Suffering for individuals, families, and communities. The first one they talk about is horizontal stressors, which happen across a timeline. And they're events that create upheaval in our normal life, in our normal, normal daily things, you know. It's like um, this destructive hurricane that hits, boom, it's, a, it's an event in time. Um, it's, it's a horizontal stressor. A house fire, um, when our house burns down, I mean, that's it's a horrible thing that happens. Death of a loved one, loss of a job, um, catastrophic illness. So we do experience those through the course of our lives. And then we have vertical stressors. That's this, the other one that they talk about, which are enduring conditions that just seem to go on forever. Like chronic illness, when, we're, when we just have this chronic health problems, poverty, racism, chronic unemployment or underemployment, lack of health care inability to access higher education. So I think most, if not all of us, have experienced one of these kind of stressors in our lives. And we can see these stressors impacting our current elections and the issues that voters care about, right? Loss of jobs, health care woes, ballooning student debt, border security, tax burdens, a lot of stresses that we're dealing with and they're impacting the elections as, as they should. And in fact, many of us are experiencing the presidential election itself as a stressor. I mean, well, I am. <laughs> so it's like, ah, you know, just, I mean, it's just, it's, there's, there are these stressors that happen. And so even though we acknowledge that God is in charge of everything, that doesn't mean that we won't experience our own plague of locusts, our own difficult situation that seems to swarm around us, biting at us and threatening our safety and our security. So we try and take care of our problems, see the therapist, elect better, hopefully, politicians who can fix the system, only to be disappointed. <laughs> no. Sorry, sorry, I just had to add that. But anyway, <laughs> I have friends who are politicians, I should say. <laughs> okay, self-help books, which are hugely popular. 
you go to a section in a bookstore and you you know you can actually go to a section in the bookstore with self-help books we're always looking for things to help us out tackle the problems because we want to handle it but we often forget that there's a spiritual component to everything we face every issue we face every situation whether good times or bad times because we are all fundamentally spiritual beings and Joel is reminding us of this God is sovereign over all and God is with us in our midst and just when we feel like we're at our wits end that our human solutions come up short God is there for us attending to our spirits and helping us to deal with those plagues that come into our lives and bringing wholeness he brings wholeness and salvation to our lives so something that I've learned from Christian mystics those those folks who are really focused and have these spiritual lives that are so rich is that when we can stay focused on our spiritual selves on God who is at the core of who we are then nothing can rattle us for long mystics see God at work in all aspects of the world and in all aspects of our lives when we approach God with deep thanksgiving and praise we can be more firmly grounded in God's love so that when those swarms of locusts come and knock us down eat the clothes off our back we can just get up and keep on going when we focus on God and know that God is right at the heart of us and the other thing that Joel points out is that God's Spirit is poured out on everyone not just on the prophets not just on our teachers who lead us but on everyone then afterward I will pour out my spirit on all flesh your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions and even on the male and female slaves in those days I will pour out my spirit and I hope he adds old women to that too so there God pours out God's Spirit on all flesh, on everyone, everyone. O children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for God has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down abundant rain. And now this is Joel talking after this plague of locusts. He's reassuring them, reassuring them you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I the Lord am your God and there is no other and my people shall never again be put to shame yes God is with us but we must also come together as God's people and also uphold our end of the relationship we heard that from Jeremiah last week, and I think that's also a part of our message this week. In addition to trying to solve all the problems with our well-meaning solutions, Joel is reminding us to call upon God, to remember God who is at the core of who we are, to give God thanks and praise. Amen.
Let us join our spirits now in prayer. Let us pray. Holy and ever-present God, you promise to hear us when we pray, and you shower us with unexpected blessings. You care for us when we are suffering, and you fill us with your goodness. When we face challenges that threaten to overcome us, you give us strength. With grateful hearts, we entrust our cares and concerns to you. For an end to violence between countries, among our own political parties, on our streets, and in our homes, we lift up our prayers to you. For the never-ending stream of refugees fleeing war, famine, poverty, and for those who are offering aid with their own limited resources, hear our prayer, O oh God. And, O oh God, we pray for those whose hearts are hardened toward the needs of immigrants and refugees who are enduring hardships beyond their control. May we all show and feel more compassion for our nation's homeless, seeking shelter on our streets, enduring hardship in our own communities. We lift up our prayers. For our Muslim sisters and brothers who face increasingly violent discrimination and abuse, and for those whose self-serving ignorance feeds into this hatred. We pray for acceptance, peace, and understanding. We pray for a way to bridge the gap and learn to love one another as Christ has taught us. We pray, O oh God, for all who have lost their way and are seeking to renew their life in Christ. And for our own private burdens, for those we name in our bulletin today, we pray in our hearts and name out loud our concerns as well as our celebrations. Thanksgiving to, O oh God, for those celebrating anniversaries and the sign of love that it offers to all of us, a symbol of your love for us. Gather up our prayers, O oh God, and those we did not know to pray, and make us ever more faithful as we lean into your coming reign of justice, peace, and love through Jesus Christ, who is our light and our hope. Amen. And so Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And today we are taking up a special offering for TWA. And I'd like to ask Elaine if she might come up and just say a word. Maybe go to that mic over there. I just want to say a quick thank you to all the generous women in this church. Um, in the past, you've given us a uh, very, very generous offering, and then it's kept the TWA group um, continuing to do various projects around the church. Last year, we completed the redecoration of the office, and I think it looks pretty nice. And I've, it's a, a nice welcoming room for people come into the church. So I just wanted to say thank you, and we do have some additional projects. Um, we did just have the women's retreat um, in September, and I think everyone that attended really had a wonderful time. So just a thank you to you all. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
thanksgiving to God and to the women of Trinity. Let us pray. O oh God, you cover us with blessings and sustain us with hope. You have given us our life and our world. We are especially grateful that we can do your work in our community through the women of TWA. Accept our gifts for the sake of those whom you love with our gratitude. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's join hands for the final benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Go out in peace knowing that God is always with you, within you, beside you, around you, to care for you and to encourage you. Go 
and serve God. Amen.